Hey, hi. Welcome to Someone Else's Movie, the original podcast where an actor, writer, director, or nebulous industry figure gives a little love to a movie they didn't make. I'm Norm Wilner, senior film writer for Now Magazine, and this is The Other Thing I Do. My guest this week is Ricky Tolman, an actor and filmmaker whose first feature, Run This Town, stars Ben Platt, Nina Dobrev, and Mina Masood as three people trying to maintain their equilibrium in the chaos of Rob Ford's mayoralty. It may strike a chord for some Toronto listeners. It opens across Canada and the U.S. this Friday, March 6th, and it'll be available on digital platforms in the U.S. as well. Ricky picked Force Majeure, Ruben Ostlin's 2014 drama about a ski vacation in the French Alps that becomes an existential crisis for a picture-perfect Swedish family after a moment of panic leads to an act of reflexive cowardice. Johannes Kunk and Lisa Loven Kongsley are Tomas and Ebba, a couple who are stunned to find their relationship completely shattered, though they're stunned for very different reasons, and they have no idea how to restore it, assuming they even want to. Also, it's kind of a comedy. This is someone else's movie. I, I went into this movie totally blind when I first saw it. I thought it was going to be a family dramedy. but which, which it is. It is, but it's it's also kind of a horror movie. It makes you feel the same things that horror movies make you feel, but for different, like, total discomfort throughout most of the movie. <laughs> and it's so singular in its vision that Ruben Oslin can just hold on his actors and trust that his words will convey what he's trying to get across. And he does. There's no gimmickry in there. It's just, it's so, it's pure cinema to me that there are just people talking in a frame and they are making me feel extreme discomfort. <laughs> um, so I, I admire his work so much. I'm a big fan of The Square, possibly more than Force Majeure, okay. which is an unpopular opinion. Um, and I, I love that for the same reason that his work sort of feels like a collection of short stories that you're following these threads of these same characters, but there are these vignettes about these lives and these people, and they are so universal, though it's so specific. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the archetypal thing, right? I mean, you're just, you're seeing this cookie cutter family with onto which you can project your own mm -hmm. uh, specifics. And then they're just completely taken apart in real time, um, like specimens. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they are trapped in all of his frames in this movie, right? Yes. Like, that's the magic of it, is that there's no edits or cuts to cut away from things. You're sitting there with them and feeling the discomfort because you're in that room. Yeah. It doesn't feel like a film because it's not edit, 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 edit. It's, you're sitting and watching um, incredibly uncomfortable dinners and um, Ebba's monologue where she's describing the avalanche, I think the instinct would be while the wife is telling this pretty shitty story about her husband that you would cut to the husband's reaction. But he holds on to that until the last possible moment. Yeah. And so we don't know what he's thinking, but we know what we're thinking. And it's, the same thing as him. It's just this real discomfort. And it's pretty amazing that he's able to do that with just her face telling the story. Because by that point, we, I think as an audience, have sort of sided, probably the majority of viewers side with her at that point. Mm -hmm. um, so you're thinking like, yeah, you're a pretty scummy guy and and you should not be looking her in the eye you should be looking down and when we get there he's not looking at her in the eye um so there's just there's so many amazing touches without moving the camera at all there's also that there's the dinner scene where she's um it, it's right before this monologue where she's just, and these are all spoilers i think yeah well we, we presume a certain <laughs> yeah of, especially now that downhill is out there um it's, it's right before she jumps into that monologue explaining to um, the, the two friends the experience that they had. She is serving them dinner. We see everybody in frame. 
and we're sitting there behind her chair watching her serve everybody. She's cut off. We see everybody else's faces. And in this scene, she's saying, oh, how great the trip is. And they're having so much fun and it's so good for them. But she's not really there because you're not seeing her face. And then when she finally joins them at the table, we're sitting behind her. So this is all like you're not feeling what she's feeling because it's all fake anyways. Yeah. The moment we see her is when she actually starts telling what she's really feeling. And I, I between those two, I mean, it's probably 15 or 20 minutes between those two scenes, there might be six cuts. Yeah. Are you aware of his strategy? Do you know how he shoots? Because it's uh, Ostland? It's because it's fascinating. How? He doesn't tell them what the frame will be. He oh, shoots really? wide and then zooms in digitally in post. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I, I didn't know that until I, I interviewed him after uh, Force Majeure played, or when Force Majeure played Tiff. And apparently <laughs> I was just staring blankly back at him, gobsmacked. Uh-huh. Like, but how do you, how, but what, don't you, what, the, don't the actors need to know they're the focus of a shot? And he's like, nope, nope, it's better if they're not. Right. It's better if they don't know. It's better if it's a play. And it never would have occurred to me. That I that's how that. he, Yeah. Right? That everything is ultra wide and then he chooses his angle later. I mean, I suppose just based on the scripts he writes, he must know what he's going to feature. Some mm-hmm. part of his brain probably cheats that. But yeah, as far as he's concerned, he tells the actors he's shooting proscenium and just lets them play the scene. Yeah. So it's the Altman method, right? You never know what uh, what part of your performance might be used, but then it's completely updated to the 21st century where you have the ability because there's so much detail in the shot that you can just zoom in on someone excluding everything else Mm -hmm. in this giant frame and create this crushing sense of intimacy with a performance uh, because all the other actors are giving just as much right like it's not someone acting to camera it's the scene playing out so I wonder how many takes I wish I'd asked him that (laughs) so like does he get I'm just thinking about uh, another dinner scene where they're sitting in the restaurant with that with the couple mm-hmm. with Brady Corbett, um, and it's just um, a two shot and two shot. Yeah. And does he shoot that twice, or does he shoot that forty times? Yeah, I mean, to get to know that he has every piece that he wants. You can't shoot it with multiple cameras, right? There's no. no way to hide them in that space well i know that um there are some shots in the movie where he's digitally removed the camera oh i wasn't aware of that well that would make sense there's a couple of shots in the bathroom where the family brushing their teeth together or, oh sure works um, husband and wife are talking at, at the counter there and we're behind them looking into the mirror so i think what i I think what I read was they had removed one of the tiles and the camera was where the tile was and they just digitally put the tile back in. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, So I I think also possibly, I was trying to figure it out a couple of times when I watched this movie, if they've just hidden the camera um, when they're having dinner um, with the American guy and their new friend Mm. because we see their reflection in the window behind them. Um, Yeah, that's far. I'm not sure if it's just like... a, a. camera guy with like a black muzz over him or something or if they digitally move them there as well it could be digital but i mean if also if they're shooting a big enough frame then the camera might just simply be perched behind something you can't see it it's and i never thought about any of the technical stuff watching it though because it's so compelling no and it feels it doesn't feel like a technical movie right Mm -hmm. it's it feels like they just put a camera there yeah so it doesn't feel like there's not in things that are digitally enhanced, though they are. Yeah, I mean, obviously... The, the avalanche scene, course, obviously. Right. Um, it's probably shot against a green screen somewhere, but mm-hmm. not for a second. And, I mean, I've watched it on... I saw it theatrically, I've watched it on fairly large screens. And even knowing what I know after the fact, I'm still... It's, I stop thinking about it, because yeah. this this movie is so immediate and, and arresting in its... Intimacy is the wrong word. I mean, it is. It's an intimate drama, but it's also, it's such a, a perceptive comedy mm-hmm. of manners and of expectations yeah. that I just, 
I just start watching people's faces. I stop thinking about everything else because the only thing that matters is the individual moment of understanding or, or cowardice or mm -hmm. and of course that's the whole point of the film right because it's about the things that we can't control the things that we the impulses that we can't control in ourselves yeah that ruin our lives and uh and help us rebuild them or don't yeah and we're all hostages mm -hmm. we're, we're trapped as much as they are with these characters yeah and it really i mean this, what being an audience member in a theater is it's you're peeping on these people mm -hmm. but he really makes the audience conscious of that i mean there's uh, there's something that i love in this movie when the the couple goes into the hallway i think three or four times to have private conversations away from the kids yeah and the i think it's maybe the first or the second time they step into the hallway to have one of these talks and they see that the janitor is standing on the landing a floor above them. Mm -hmm. And they turn to the camera and they say, sorry, can you give us some privacy? And then it just cuts. So it's like, you were the janitor there. Yeah. I love that. And that it's like, they don't let us hear what the conversation was, but the next day we can feel what that was. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah, it's something that is... And I wonder if he found that afterwards if if that conversation exists on film somewhere mm -hmm. or if that was written into the script i i would imagine it's written into the script i would be willing to believe that yeah because he is absolutely aware of the voyeuristic nature of the yeah. movie and and that janitor becomes a character that he has no lines yeah he's he's a, an amazing running gag yeah he's this quiet working class judgment yeah yeah at the bourgeoisie lifestyle that is crumbling mm -hmm. uh throughout the entire film the there really is no one big statement, which I kept waiting for mm -hmm. the first time through. Um, and that's the, the, I think the greatest thing about it is that it's an incoherent breakdown. Mm -hmm. When he, when he loses it, he just, he is inarticulate and can't stop crying. And all of these things that a man is not supposed to be mm -hmm. based on the film's reading of what the characters perceive to be ideal masculinity, but the fragility of it, the frailty of it, the fact that, you know, the fact that he grabs his phone instead of his kids. I know. It's, again, it's the sort of thing you can read as animal instinct just colliding with decency where you keep waiting for him to just say, I thought you were right behind me, come up with any excuse that'll make it better. But it's someone who sees himself in that moment. Like, he comes back to the table, pretends everything is fine. Mm -hmm. Everyone knows it's not fine. And... When I saw it with an audience, it was a press screening, and I think people had seen it at Cannes, so it was a fairly sparsely attended room. It was those of us that didn't. Mm -hmm. And maybe 10 people, roughly half men and women, and what I noticed in the theater, because I sit fairly far in the back, was the women were leaning forward and the men were leaning backward. That The, the entire rest of the, the, the post-avalanche um, moment... Mm -hmm. The women were leaning in because they wanted to see what was going to happen. And we all knew the men mm -hmm. were just recoiling into ourselves. And it's this, and I'm sure the women knew as well. Um, but it's this moment. I wish I'd seen it with a packed room just yeah. to feel how it plays with an audience. Um, how, how did you see it? Did you see it theatrically? I saw it. I actually saw. I saw the square when it first played at a festival okay but i was so taken with just the description of what the square was before i saw it that i rented force majeure oh, at the library um so it was just like i'd heard about it um but the just description of the square is what made me look into his other work and i'd heard about it you know is i'd also seen uh when the oscar nomination have you seen the video of him when the oscar nominations yes. were announced yeah. and there's this video of ruben osland reacting to not being nominated because everyone expected this movie to be nominated and it's just it's a short film of his yeah it's amazing it is it's great um 
and that really made me want to see this because it's like he has a sense of humor that is strange and he doesn't say it's a joke. And yeah. I think that's so much of what is in this movie. It's yeah. he never breaks. No, that's, that's his gift. I yeah, he can he can keep a straight face through almost anything. It's really unbelievable. And I, I mean, there's that scene in the square, which is sequence, which I think might be my favorite sequence of the last 10 years oh, yeah. of any film. He's just able to make you laugh and feel terror and then hate yourself a couple of seconds later. And I don't know that there's any other filmmaker that makes me feel that way when I watch his films. That I really feel shitty about (laughs) myself. Not for the characters, but for smiling. Yeah. I... He can do in five seconds what the, the only example I can ever come up with is Man Bites Dog, the, um, the Belgian film from 92, uh, which, was a, which was a tiff as well, actually. Um, it's about a documentary film crew following a serial killer around mm-hmm. Brussels as he just casually murders people. And it's a comedy, and it's brilliant. It's, it's really funny. Mm-hmm. The... Um, the character Ben is uh, played by one of the co-directors, Benoit Pouvord, who's an actor primarily, and he, I butchered his name just now, I can tell, and he is very ingratiating and he's making jokes to the camera, and now, it, you know, 30 years later, it would be indistinguishable from any reality television show, right. but in 1992, black and white 16 millimeter stock, it was stunning, mm-hmm. and the, the, we are complicit, we are following this guy along as he kill he at one point he kills a woman an older woman by screaming at her so loudly that she has a heart attack because he doesn't want to spend money on a bullet right and it's just he doesn't have a purpose he doesn't have he's not working for hire he's just randomly killing individuals and then there's a moment um almost towards the end of the film maybe maybe certainly the last reel where he is stalking people It turns into a rape, which is ugly and horrible, and he invites the crew to join by looking directly into the camera saying, come on, come on, come Mm -hmm. on. And the entire theater just gasps because you're indicted. Mm -hmm. You're you're suddenly aware. But it took 80 minutes to get there, Mm -hmm. and it was really fun to get there. And I mean, that's the the brilliance of this film is that it has this this snake that eats its tail but ultimately stabs you in the face once before that does that. And... Oslin can do it in a shot in two seconds yeah. he can he can spin the entire uh, the aesthetic works to spin the perspective to disorient us and then suddenly reorient us in a place where oh no that's my fault like, yeah. I this is me now yeah and nobody else does this yeah. it's it's almost offensive to me that he can do it in more than one film that it's he's really it's his trick when I saw the square in theaters, that monkey man sequence mm. I've never felt other people's discomfort around me as much as I felt in that theater yeah this is what I mean about force majeure you just you are aware that you're not the only person in the room in a really ugly awful way yeah but that you still enjoy complicit uh, not complicitly you can still enjoy it because the movie makes it okay for you to be in that space Mm -hmm. while wondering what the hell you're doing there. Well, it's like funny games, right? I was about to bring up Panicky, yeah. I'll never forget... When did that come out? The the original? The original. 97. Because my friend and I... How old was I at the time? It's probably 12. (laughs) We, We would rent just movies that we shouldn't have rented and that was one of them and I remember when the wife fights back and he rewinds he's like no no, that's not supposed to what's supposed to happen and he rewinds and it's like yeah I did want to see the other way that this goes and looking I mean as a 12 year old I was like yeah yeah (laughs) you know sure but now you watch that and you still feel the same way. And it's like, 
have I grown up or have I grown into a terrible person? Right. Are all people terrible that this is something that is in a film that he knew he could toy with? And that just must be a universal feeling that people want to just be the observer of something terrible and uncomfortable. Well, especially with the safety of us knowing it's not real. Yeah. Right? That we're watching actors. Mm-hmm. The, well, I mean, that was his, famously, he said, like, if the peop, if the audience stays till the end of the movie, I failed. Mm-hmm. But that always seemed to me to be incredibly disingenuous because, of course, they're going to stay to the end of yeah. the movie. You built this trap for them. Yeah. And Haneke is one of those filmmakers who, when he works... It's devastating when the thing comes together properly at, you know, Benny's Video or The Seventh Continent or or even Amour, where you're just trapped with the sadness and desperation of people who are boxed in in a place where they can't mm-hmm. change to anything. Um, Funny Games films, both of them felt weirdly cynical to me just because you are building a trap for the audience rather than taking them somewhere. Mm-hmm. You've, I mean, you've, you've led them into a box where whatever they do, they lose and you win. Yeah. Um, Oslin doesn't do that. Yeah. Oslin gives you the room to... You can... I mean, nobody wants to leave because we want to see where this goes, but he's also not torturing his characters in the same way that Haneke is mm-hmm. by you know actively taking away the opportunities they have to change their own narrative. All of, of Oslin's movies are about people given the opportunity to, to make things better for themselves. Mm-hmm. Whether or not they take it, it's their failing. It's not the film's forcing it on them. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I think that's how I think. Well, I, don't, I mean, you look at maybe the husband and wife, and he really starts digging himself deep to a point yeah. where can he really say that, yeah, you're right? Because he doesn't, he keeps on saying, I don't see it that way. That's not what happened. And so when he eventually, if he does admit that, no, I do see it your way, I was lying, isn't that worse? Yeah, but that's what's fascinating about yeah. it. At what point does it become a point of no return? Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know, the ending is funny because, I mean, it's a little open-ended. Um, They're all going to freeze to death. <laughs> yeah, but... Sasquatches but, will come. The there, Yeti will come. There was... I, I was I, I rewatched it before um, we had this conversation and looking at the last scene where they decide to ski in these terrible foggy conditions mm-hmm. they can't see ten meters in front of one another um, the mother disappears and then he goes the husband father goes to save her and brings her back and then puts her down. She's like, I'm going to go get my skis. She walks back up the hill. It's like, what does that mean? Right? Like, what does that mean to you? Yeah. Um, I'm trying to figure out what I should and shouldn't say. Downhill just opened and it's playing. It's <laughs> terrible. But Downhill handles that scene very differently by showing us what happens when he goes to get her. Oh, really? And it botches it completely. Um, it is so much better to leave those things ambiguous because otherwise we know and it stops being about what we would do as audience members and stops being about what the right thing to do is because once the movie shows you what it is you don't have to think about it anymore Mm -hmm. you can disagree with it but it's just so self-defeating yeah and what Ostland is doing is just leaving us in that space wondering what anyone could do to make this scene the situation better right and nothing can right i mean that's what happens with um the characters yeah yeah it's ebba and tomas i always so, say johanna i know that's not right because that, that's the actor's name yeah um so tomas's friend that he knows from wherever comes with his younger girlfriend when Eva tells that the story about what happened to them and Tomas's friend tries to think of ways that this might not be as bad as it seems yeah. or he was actually trying to help them which and is, then yeah. I don't know what happens in Town Hill but in Force Majeure we follow which is you don't see this happening in American film we follow these two characters that we don't know for what 10 or 15 minutes as they discuss yeah, they have the what it means so. Um, and 
this is not in downhill. Right. Which is, okay. Again, a huge problem because why not? Yeah. But yeah, it's downhill is also only like eighty six minutes long, so it's hyper focused on the nuclear family, which mm-hmm. and also the kids are both sons now, which is weird. That is just a strange choice. I think they're supposed to be twins, but anyway, sorry. Um, I forget what I was going to say. Oh, the um, the secondary characters go off to have their own. Yeah, and I just I love that he whether we're seeing somebody for a couple of moments like the janitor without any lines. Or these other characters, everyone has their own story, and also you know what their take is on these characters. Yeah. So, I mean, they're all audience members to this tragedy, <laughs> and you just become another person in this shining hotel. Yeah. You know? Um,. And it is. It's a temple to luxury. Yeah. That every comfort is available to you, every pleasure, and no one's happy. Yeah. They're all just miserable in these in these ornate settings. There's a, a runner in the remake about the kids just wanting to watch their... They want screen time. They just want to watch the iPad mm-hmm. instead of doing anything. Mm-hmm. Which I get. That's definitely an American angle. But it's also a weird way of not acknowledging just how much trauma the kids are processing because they were on that balcony too they were all part of this yeah and i think oslin is just a little bit more aware that this the whole point of this movie is that this is an incident you don't just shake off yeah Uh, and as much as tomas would like to he is just building up this trauma and i don't think i've ever seen pst develop in real time the way it does in the uh, pstd yeah. PT- God damn it. PTSD. I, PTSD. I don't think I've ever seen PTSD develop in real time before, but yeah. it's just amazing to watch that actor carry it in his, in his shoulders, in his throat, in the way he starts to not... He can't... It's not that he can't look people in the eye past a certain point. He can't even raise his head. Yeah. It's just... It's an amazing performance. Yeah. And it's of somebody I find absolutely despicable. I know. For his weakness. And I'm still into it. I'm, in, I'm like, my empathy is just working double time the same way that, you know, his friend is trying to say, well, maybe it meant this, maybe it meant that. Mm-hmm. We've all been, I, I would assume, it certainly happened to me a lot. We've all been in situations where you immediately try to rationalize bad behavior from someone you know because you know them and that mm-hmm. can't possibly be that person. Yeah. And then the longer you go on, it's just the worse it gets for everyone. Right. Well, it's like that Seinfeld episode. Yeah. Did you watch Seinfeld? I did, yeah. Um, I mean, where George is at the kid's birthday party and there's smoke coming out of the kitchen. Yeah. So he pushes everybody out of the way to get to the door. And then he's at the fire truck later. And they're like, why did you push everyone out the way? He was like, I was trying to lead the way. Yes. <laughs> I assume they were right behind Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And again, the show has us on side because we know these people are yeah. despicable. But and George is a a single awful person. Mm-hmm. He's not a husband and father. He's, yeah. He doesn't have the the presumed responsibilities and the position that he lords over, you know, like he's in charge when we see him at the beginning. He's yeah. he's not aggressive about it, but he is the leader of this family. Mm-hmm. And then 11 minutes in, it's all just completely upended. Yeah. And, yeah, he never even says, I thought you were right behind me. I kept waiting for that feeble excuse, yeah. at the very least, to try to apologize in a way, to at least acknowledge the existence of other people. Yeah. But he won't even give them that. Yeah. It's just this failing built in. Yeah. Of, of fail, of, of re, well, when you're in a hole, stop digging. But it's not even that. It's just, no, no, uh, it wasn't as bad as you think it was. He's yeah. trying to gaslight an entire um, hotel full of people. Yeah. And, and I just love that he gets his friend on side with him. Yeah. It, that, when we start following that other couple, mm. is a masterstroke to me. That the director is confident enough that we can leave these other characters that we've invested in now to go see this entirely different domestic drama play out for yeah. 10 minutes. Um, just to hear what these people think and what they would do. Um, Which is the conversation all of us are having. And how the avalanche infects their their relationship as well. They weren't even there, but now it's part of their relationship. And I think so many of the reviews of this movie said, like, 
don't go see this with somebody you love. <laughs> and I think because people would leave the theater hating the person that they're with if they didn't agree with them. Yeah, quite possibly. Like, or they would just feel like somebody's lying. Like, of course I would save you. It's like, but would you? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. It's the... Um it's the greatest thing a movie can do is just not stop when it's over. Yeah. And just carry along. Yeah. And we're all swept up in whatever argument, whatever moral quandary we're left with. But it's just, it is so easy to just say, no, baby, of course I would, you know, I'd pick you up and carry you myself. Yeah. Because that's what we all want to do. Mm -hmm. That's what we believe we would do, I'm sure. And then when you're confronted with it, you know, I can't. I can't, I can't remember where I read this, but only in the last few years, apparently, has, you know, the fight or flight concept been amended to include freezing, which is something that some people do mm -hmm. in, a, in a crisis, in a, in a panic moment. You don't necessarily take action at all. Mm -hmm. You don't go forward or backward. You just freeze. Mm -hmm. uh, some people freeze. And I've been fascinated with this because I wonder how long it took for anyone to be even willing to admit that in any kind of survey or interview or conversation where it's like well i didn't do either of those things but how can you admit to not doing one of the two things you're supposed to do right how you know we're, we're so ingrained in these ideas of what it is to be a person and, and to be um, a social creature mm -hmm. and that's i mean obviously that's what all of us films are about what is it to not do the thing that you're supposed to do and what does that make you feel and how do you ever come back from that and it's so much more complex than I saw this movie and it made me wonder about something yeah. I, I love the fact that his films just keep digging um, in their specificity and in their in their framing there is no way out you can make this stop by saying you're sorry but if you don't it just keeps going mm -hmm. and it's a it's you know Danny, well that's why it's like a horror movie yeah because you could ju just go out of the house you'll be fine, but if somebody just stays there because they feel like they can take it on, they're going to die, and you know that, and you're watching them, and you're so uncomfortable the whole time. Yeah. And These are Saw movies. Yeah. I mean, they really, they, they, they're funnier, yeah. <laughs> thankfully, and they're cleaner, but they delight in the idea that people can just contribute to their own misery mm -hmm. without ever understanding the mechanisms that are there to escape. Yeah. Like, you could just... I mean, the square, the concept of it, step outside and it's over, we don't have that here. Yeah. There is no outside. Yeah. I mean, there is outside, but it's worse. Yeah. And, I mean, just... In terms of his... I mean, making it a horror movie, that's funny, but it's... The... I don't know, in the first five minutes, the only sounds you hear are the... Vivaldi track mm -hmm. and just the sound of like the uh, the gondola the what's it called the, the cable right just going and that's I mean it's you hear that throughout the movie and the sound design the the things that he chooses to focus on in the sound are are things that would be in a Saw movie yeah Right? Yeah, I mean, those are the... To irritate and... Unfair. Yeah, that are just supposed to be irritating and get on your nerves and drive you crazy. And they're locked there with those sounds. Yeah. I was going to say, Danny Boyle used to talk about his, his actors as specimens, that he dissects every single one of them in every movie. That mm -hmm. All of his films are about interrogating someone's beliefs under fire, under um, uh, pressure, however... The film is unfolding it's always about finding one character and just unpacking that person mm -hmm. and what Oslin does is similar in that he is just detached enough visually to give us a sense of distance that we can treat them as um, template characters or, or types rather than specific people mm -hmm. but then the actors do the job of filling in the humanity yeah so you get physical ticks and, and, and all the stuff that, that Tomas is going through exhibits itself. It comes out. It presents itself through his body. Yeah. Um, and the square has some physical stuff as well. But the other thing that 
Oslin does by creating those long, long takes is that he forces to watch us l- watch people listening to each other yeah. or not listening to each other and just see how that goes. And it's a dynamic that, you know, Haneke doesn't have any time for that either, really. Um, it, it, films, it feels like in his films he's always waiting for the moment of revelation where someone can just say, nope, that's not going to happen at all. Yeah. I, I, I reject your argument. And Force Majeure, even more than The Square, because The Square, I think, is more about watching people watch each other. Yeah. Force Majeure is about whether or not Ebba will accept Tomas's version of reality. Mm-hmm. And we are rooting against that because we want her to win. Yeah. We want this weakling to be held to account. But that's an awful place for us to be. Like, yeah. we, are, we are actually angrier with him than she is at one or two points, I think. Yeah. Uh, because I mean, we don't he, love him. When right? he breaks down and starts crying... It's incredibly irritating, and I. Yeah. Th- it's also I don't know if he's actually crying. I. Oh, you think it's performance? I think it might be performance that he. This is his last ditch effort to just get her to forgive him because. Maybe he's cried before, and he knows that she'll move on because okay. she feels badly. He's manipulating what he thinks are her maternal instincts or whatever. Um, and waiting for her to be the mean one here to say, like, well, you didn't even help me when I was so distraught. Um, so I'm not totally sure that he actually feels bad or if he's just manipulating her That's and the instincts that he knows that she has or expects her to have. I, you know, that it's not something I really considered because it seems so over the top that it's not something he can stop, right? Mm-hmm. The fact that it keeps going suggests to me that he can't control it, that he can't help himself, that it's the big unva- uh, the unburdening, that he's letting it all out. But now, yeah, you, you may well have a... I mean... Because that's how it, it would play if you were yeah, doing it on purpose. Like, you play it big, yeah. and then maybe it becomes something else because something pours out of you. Mm. Um, or you feel bad for other reasons... But I, it never feels genuine to me. And it's not because of his acting. He's great in the movie. But that part to me feels like an actor acting. Okay. In character. Like the character yeah, yeah. is the actor. Yeah. Interesting. I honestly never thought about it. But now I, I can sort of see it. And maybe it's because it, it feels like the point in the narrative where he should break. Mm-hmm. But of course, if he was playing her he would know that too so this level of metatextual awareness oh man now i just want to watch that scene again yeah i i think he's playing her but would he do it in front of the janitor would he do that public would he debase himself publicly if he didn't mean it because there is a witness i mean in addition to the audience (sighs) see now i'm digging myself in deeper to keep my own version (laughs) i'm not sure because would if he thinks this is the last chance because it's I think it's the last night there yeah I mean if he's thinking of it as performance then having somebody there to watch it makes it feel more real right maybe he doesn't realize it'll get so big he doesn't want to do it in front of the kids Mm mm-hmm but then he can't contain it. But then it becomes part of the performance when he's really holding on to those kids on the floor there. Yeah. It's like, no real person does that. It's true. He's yes-ending himself. Yeah. Huh. He's really making it a portrait for her. Like, look, I'm such a great father and I'm going to take care of these kids now and shown my emotions. Yeah, it's true. It changes the narrative completely. It's not remember when we had the uh, when we had that horrible moment where I ran away from the avalanche. It's remember how sad I was that we had that horrible moment where I mm-hmm. Oh man, yeah, that's manipulative. Yeah. And then we're given a new example of of uh, an unheeding male authority figure in the bus driver. Mm-hmm. So that I I mean I assume that that's what ultimately makes it all okay in that we can leave, or they can leave this experience figuring that at least Tomas tried. Right. You know, he stands up very, very um, demonstrably, 
not aggressively, but mm-hmm. he makes sure people see him do the right thing. Yeah. Um, even though he's not the first person to do so, and he's also not the one who does it best. He's a, he's a helper now. Right. He's attentive and listening. But what do you make of that whole coda with the bus? I think... Some people don't like the coda. They think it should have ended on the hill. Oh, oh no. You I think... mean, I think that it could. It certainly could end at the... Downhill ends on the hill, mm-hmm. uh, effectively. It doesn't have the bus coda at all. But the... I think it only works because we can see the windows of the bus. Mm-hmm. And... You know, we've all had a moment where we felt that we didn't have enough control of a situation in which we were, you know, we have, we, you surrender your autonomy when you get into a cab, you in a bus, a train, a plane, all of those things. And everybody knows what that helplessness feels like. And we all do the same thing, I think, which is sit very still and hope that it ends mm-hmm. and hope that everything corrects itself. Because you assume that the person with the controls is in charge, is, is there because that person is in charge and can do the thing. And the way it plays out here with one person getting nervous and then it's slowly infecting the rest of the passengers and us fully aware that the roads are probably safe, buses don't crash that often, you never hear about this sort of thing, this is clearly the bus and it does this every day. Mm -hmm. Our brains are doing the same thing, but the beauty of that orchestration is that when you're in a movie theater, you feel the frame moving. Yeah. And we eventually get on board and i've noticed this and and i mean i'm gonna say i've noticed this about myself in repeated viewings of the scene theatrically it felt much worse mm-hmm. but of course that was also the first time yeah. i saw it so i don't know if it's as bad if you see it the first time on on video i'm assuming it was for you that you just become more and more anxious and yeah i mean i think i still felt it yeah even though i didn't see it on a massive screen yeah i was in a big enough theater that it was really disconcerting and again the the 10 of us that were there yeah. were all equally uncomfortable. And it's not nauseating from the the swaying of it. It's nauseating from the tension. Mm-hmm. But it really does dig into this thing. Like, you know, at this point in this movie, I could actually believe that they're all going to die. That yeah. he's going to kill them all for some beautiful, dramatic uh, statement about failure to act. Yeah. But then they act. And then it stops. But when Ebba's the first one to act, she jumps off the bus alone. She doesn't take her kids, right? Yeah, yeah. And so I always wonder at the end, when they're walking down the hill there, if Tomas feels like he's won because... He's watched her abandon them. Yeah. Um. And she's not holding any of the kids. Yeah, and I think that's why they cut it from downhill, because it doesn't give you that sense I mean it, it does very clearly give you the sense that everyone is a, has leveled the playing field mm-hmm. that I mean I think I think the couple is doomed I think that this is the end for them um, and I was you know I was sort of kidding when I said that the Yetis eat them but I think it's also entirely possible that the only thing that could actually get them together again would be some sort of attack mm-hmm. uh, where they all have to the, the entire group has to band together to work and that's not going to happen because it's not that kind of movie yeah the the sense that they are alone with each other now is just so crushing um and again still comic it's still kind of funny Mm -hmm. to watch them all trying to deal with this triumph together separately Mm -hmm. that you know we've survived this awful thing and here's another awful thing that we've survived but it's not going to help. Yeah. The two wrongs don't make a right, right? I mean, it, this will not fix them. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of the remake, Downhill, <laughs> it's so I, bad. When, when I heard that they were, I mean, they had announced that many years ago. I think they've been developing this with yeah. Julia Louis Dreyfus attached to this yeah, for a while. And they didn't cast Farrell until very close, I think. And yeah. that's when we heard about. Like the start date, right? When they started yeah. shooting it, they made an announcement of yeah. some sort. And I thought, at the time, it's like, oh, okay. But what I always thought they were going to do was reverse the gender roles. Right. And make her abandon the kids when the avalanche happens, which might have been a reason to make the movie. Yeah. To or deconstruct just... it from that perspective, at least. Or even not... just put more of a focus on her. Because Ebba is mostly 
uh, I guess, uh, other than the monologue, which is the same thing that happens in, in or rather the scene, other than the monologue, which is replicated in the new film, mm-hmm. Ebba is mostly sidelined. Mm-hmm. It, it's the force majeure is about Tomas mm-hmm. and his suffering. Um, downhill. Shifts I don't the, see it that way. No, no. I see it as Ebba's movie. Okay. Because she's watching, because she's present, even when she's not doing much? Yeah, I mean, even when when she goes off on her ski day alone and Tomas takes the kids, we see them for a moment, but we see her seeing them. We don't... It's, it's still from her perspective that she... That this person is now not part of that unit. So... When we do see Tomas with his kids and they're sort of fighting, um, you feel her missing. Okay. Um, so it's and, structuring absence. Yeah. And when she has drinks with her new friend, um, they're actually talking about things. And you're feeling Ebba deconstruct her marriage when we see Tomas with his friend in that very uncomfortable scene where a woman comes up to him and says oh my mm-hmm. friend thinks you're the most handsome person on the hill um, they're not talking they're just two guys lounging on chairs excited that a girl took notice of them until she didn't right. um, so it's, that to me is I'm not learning anything that I don't know about guys in that moment, but I felt like I'm learning about Ebba's character way more when I see her on her own than I am with Tomas. Okay, that's fair. I I watch that scene with, with Tomas and his friend very closely because I want to see how he is handling the reassertion of... I mean, even though it doesn't ultimately turn out to be valid or true, he suddenly has a chance to be a man again, mm-hmm. to be masculine. And I find that fascinating because you can see... He's wrestling with it, and he's trying not to enjoy himself. And that scene is replicated exactly in the remake. And again, it's just in one shot like that too. Uh, no, okay, God, God no. Okay. Now they, um, as much as I, as much as I like uh, the way way back, Faxon and, and Rash just do not have the, the same rigor or, um, or even I think the attention span, or they don't trust the audience to have it, to pull that off. Yeah. But, Farrell in the second half of Downhill starts sort of the way the way his character acts out is to become kind of even more of a Will Ferrell character if that makes any sense like a sort of a dim-witted Frank the Tank sort of thing from old school there's a scene where he um, the club scene uh, where he's basically just gets himself hammered and tries to pick a fight with people which kind of happened in the original Mm -hmm. but the execution here is just like hey remember when Will Ferrell used to make movies like this and they were comedies right don't do that That that's not what this story is about yeah Um, the biggest failure about Downhill is not that it isn't a shot for shot remake of Force Majeure but that it tries to turn it into something that makes no sense Mm -hmm. Uh, and yeah taking it from Ebba's perspective shooting it or not sorry not taking it from Ebba's perspective but framing it in such a way that Ebba is the one who flees that the Billy, the, the Julia du- Louis Dreyfus character, that would be fascinating. But I think it's also unsellable to a North American market to a remake. You know, like it's you make a story about a mother who abandons her husband and children in a moment of weakness, and there's no coming back from that, mm-hmm. like either for drama or comedy. Like the movie is over. Mm-hmm. It's it's. But done. isn't that what makes it interesting? It is. It absolutely is. But it's unpalatable, right? Mm-hmm. And if you're making a movie for a studio, you have to. Downhill establishes that it's not going to be that kind of movie very, very quickly. It's got, you know, wacky music and aren't all these foreigners strange and look at the the awkward yeah. Americans in this place where Miranda Otto shows up in the first five minutes as, as the new friend, who ultimately will be Billy's new friend, and she's just, you know, she's weird and her syntax is goofy and mm-hmm. it's a it's it's like Eurotrip. It's somehow right. invaded this, this art film. And, yeah... Just wrong foots it from the very Which is a shame mind. because I would love to see the Julia Louis Dreyfus version where she's where it's not playing it straight because it's still comedy, mm-hmm. but playing it real. Yeah, and she is that's the fascinating thing halfway through the film where it becomes obvious in her version of Ebba's monologue, she has not only seen Force Majeure, but she likes it and wants to honor it. Mm-hmm. And the movie doesn't have any time for that. 
um, they give her they give her wackiness as well. Mm. But Julia Louis Dreyfus, and it's not Farrell's fault that he isn't on her level. It's just the the role he's playing doesn't let it happen. Mm-hmm. But she is giving a really great dramatic performance in a film that just doesn't want to be a drama. And it's. Do you think it was recut that way, and it was uh, shot differently? Possibly, but I doubt it. Yeah, but think... then you have all the European characters. Yeah, speaking. Everyone's so pitched. Yeah. Um, Zach Woods, when he shows up in the Brady Corbett role, is definitely playing dry comedy mm. in the Zach Woods way. Like, I don't think you cast Zach Woods if you want to make a straight film. Right. He has an energy that's unpredictable in a timing. I mean, it's wonderful, and I love what he does. But it's again, it's just inappropriately used here. Right. Uh, the same way that Farrell is. Well, I mean, uh, we we talked about it off mic, but they cut the scene. They cut the breakdown. It's not there. Mm-hmm. And. I don't know why you cast Will Ferrell in this role if you're not going to let him go as big as the role can go. Right. Because that is kind of the point. And maybe, you know, as you said, maybe they shot it and it didn't work. Mm-hmm. But based on what they kept in, I can't imagine that that's a reason to cut something. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm incredibly disappointed. Yeah. And, and very sad that I had to go. In. And it's also, it feels three hours long. It's 87 minutes long, 86 or something. Uh, it feels twice as long as Force Majeure, which is yeah. amazing. Because Force Majeure is deliberate and slow, but it's never boring. No. It's just... it's It really winds you up. Yeah. It's, it it's, winds you the entire time. Yeah, it's a coiled spring by the end of it with no release. Yeah. Which is... I mean, from the first... After the introduction to the family getting the portraits taken, I mean, you're hearing cannons being shot, and yeah. it's intense. And from then, I just think... There's no score in the movie, I don't think. It's just... It's open and close. It's right, just the yeah. Vivaldi track. Yeah. And that's really over, like, montages of snow being fixed. Um, yeah, it's more establishing a mood. It's, yeah. Uh, Downhill has a score. And right. it's yodeling. Okay. See, that? right? That gives yeah. you everything about what the kind of movie this is. It's just like, you know, let's... let's and, and maybe you use it aesthetically against what's happening in the film, but that's not what this does. Right. It's just... I can see how every decision happened i can see how people talk themselves into this uh i would love to see a different cut of what, what the first assembly looked like mm-hmm. but I, i'm sure we never will which is very disappointing to me right maybe it'll be a criterion version yeah it's not gonna happen <laughs> maybe it'll be a force majeure downhill double feature criterion i would go for that that's um, a great way to do it <laughs> well, right. oh yeah the other thing i want to say when we were talking about the la the coda the last sequence i so he's in production now, or he's going into production on this new movie, Triangle of Sadness. That's the title? Yeah. That's amazing. And it's, I've read two lines of what it's about, but it feels like it might almost be like a spiritual continuation okay. of what happens after that moment, because it's about a yacht of wealthy models and and playboys that get stranded on an island and okay. them trying to survive together um huh. i also i guess i can say this because i won't say who i read six pages of the script okay and it's very uncomfortable <laughs> incredibly and even just the words on the page it's so funny and and doesn't seem extreme in like the American version of what that might be right it feels like you might just be watching this actually happen and what people might archetypes might react to to that situation um how they would react uh so i wonder if if that end of the movie if he was like well what would happen to all these wealthy people going down the hill together but then yeah there's an explosion and now they all have to survive in the mountains together i can certainly see that i mean it would they would embrace it as a bonding experience it would fall apart almost immediately yeah uh oh man triangle of sadness what a perfect name i know I saw, and I, um, I don't know, I just, 
I follow him on Instagram, or his production company on Instagram, and they have all the behind the scenes of them doing the production design and all that, and because it takes place on a ship, um, I think they called it the Captain's Dinner, and it's obviously on a soundstage that they've built this dining room in a ship that's going from side to side, and all the tables are slipping and sliding <laughs> like this. Okay. Um, so it's just... I mean, I can't wait for that. Just based on the couple of pages that I read. Yeah, it sounds like the um, it sounds like his version of Chevalier. Or Wait. Chevalier, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing it. Athena Rachel Singari's film about the oh six uh, six Greek captains of industry on a boat that they're all men. Oh, okay. And they ultimately, just start playing games, power games with each other, uh-huh. and, and it doesn't quite go Lord of the Flies the way I think this is about to. But right, the pitch, the potential is always there. Right. Yeah, I don't know. I've just read two and this the scene that I read was not on an island it feels like it's probably an early scene okay um very uncomfortable oh good I don't want to know anything else no that's so great I'm so there yeah and the idea that he's building sound stages now too that sounds like the Roy Anderson kind of approach where you just create your entire world and then lock us in with yeah it. Oh, okay good 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 yeah I have hope I mean not that I don't I think he's he has yet to make a bad film. I think all of his stuff is fantastic, but oh, this sounds yeah. The square's too big in a weird way. Like it just it sprawls out too much. Mm-hmm. Well, that's concept. the one that to me, I mean, it really feels like a collection of short stories. You're mm-hmm. following the same characters, but they're all just pieces, yeah, individual incidents. Yeah, cool. Which I mean, they could all be their own short films. Yeah, and right? it pays off as a feature. It yeah. works as a feature, but it does feel... It, it felt to me like a strange sort of deviation based on the, the acuity and the intensity, the focus mm-hmm. of the other films. Uh, so the the final question, the, the, out, the way out on the podcast is always the same, which is, is there anything of Force Majeure or even Austin's films in general that you have borrowed or stolen or, or incorporated into your own work. I was trying to think of a connection and run this town and, and part of it is being trapped in a space with someone who will not behave. So I can... Well, there is that. It. There's the sequence um, in the office at night um, where all the young interns and aides are, are working late and having a good time and they think something funny happened, but then it turns out not to be funny. Um, and I think that was partially inspired by the monkey man scene in the square. Okay. Um, of something that starts out ridiculous and you're laughing as an audience member and people there in, in, in the movie are smirking and then maybe it gets a little uncomfortable and you want it to be over but it doesn't end and it continues until it has to end right um so just that feeling of of being trapped in the room i think he can do like nobody else um so I wouldn't say that I've stolen it from him because it's not like him at all. Right. Um, but just that feeling of of discomfort is something I I hope that I'm able to fold into things that I work on because it's great to laugh at a movie or cry, but feeling like you don't want to be there but you don't want to leave because you want to know what happens, right, I think right. is is such a strange reaction to something that you've paid to go see. <laughs> yeah. It is, I mean, it's something that, that never ceases to amaze me is that we willingly subject ourselves to these horrific experiences. And not just, I mean, horror movies, obviously, but just the idea that anything can be uh, rationalized as long as it's not real, as long as you accept that it isn't real. But then you see people paying to see movies like The Act of Killing or... or the Look of Silence, yeah. for Sama, which are tremendous works of art, but you are choosing to suffer for X amount of time, which I do all the time. But it is a weird thing of submitting yourself, right? No matter what the tone is, no matter what it's going to be, what we are ultimately submitting ourselves to these experiences voluntarily. So, of course, it's funny games all over again. You don't want to leave. You want to know what happens. Yeah. Even though you're having no fun whatsoever. No. 
it's not funny. <laughs> exactly. Um, I mean, I admire anybody that can hold long takes and just knows that the performances they're getting can sustain an audience's attention. I didn't know his his technique that he pops in yeah. on things, but he really has to trust himself to know that he could just slow zoom in on a guy being built up and brought down yeah. within the span of three minutes and it's just one shot and tells us so much about it. I mean, that we could read so much on Tomas's face and through his body language in a wide shot that's, I mean, it zooms, but it's not, doesn't, it's not a close up. Yeah. I mean, it's just incredible. Yeah. I wonder how you even rehearse something like that. I mean, just how do you do it? Do you do it at like half speed? Do you get the actors to not give themselves over to it in the rehearsal? Because that way they'll have nothing left for the shoot. Mm -hmm. Do you shoot your rehearsals? I mean, I just, there's so much about his approach um, that feels calculated and, and Kubrickian but it never plays that way mm-hmm. I mean people compare Force Majeure to Kubrick because of the, the slow action of the camera and the patience of, of the takes but I, I don't think like, I don't think Kubrick was interested in that level of human frailty I mean, mm-hmm. he was he was always much happier to see people as objects mm-hmm. and so when the comparisons were made it's like well I guess so but it's a totally different um flavor or strain of cinema yeah um and, you know obviously much more european in in its embrace of complexity and frailty but also just so much more cruel than kubrick in in in, in sticking people with a pin into the center and just letting them wriggle for our yeah. entertainment but again it's really funny i yeah. don't think we're talking about how funny I, mean, I i i know that i gravitate towards the heavier themes in this film but it is it's hysterical funny. yeah it's so funny i love it it's i mean it's just he's also again that youtube video of him reacting to the os who does that right i mean he just doesn't care it yeah. seems he just he he likes to play with perceptions of how people should react even yeah. with himself and it's just very funny. He's so funny and smart. He's the smartest person. <laughs> yeah, I gotta dig up this video he sent to the TFCA when we. I've seen that. Yeah, I've tried to circulate it for the for people on the Twitter feed because it's, again, yeah, you're right. He knows what we expect from a given moment because we all have this programmed emotional response, and he just refuses to deliver it, mm-hmm. uh, and then asks us why we are programmed in the way we are. Yeah, and. Um, yeah, I want to believe that I would use the table as the shield and, and save everybody. But I I think myself, I would probably just sit there and think this is... I would be the this is fine dog. I would just be waiting for it to be over. Mm-hmm. Um, which probably isn't usually the right move. Yeah. I was at a Q&A for the square. And somebody asked a question about how he achieved one of the shots. And I remember he reacted like... He was confused why they were asking about one of the shots when he was like, that's not what people should take away from this movie. It's not the shots. It's like, how did it make you feel? (laughs) You know, not why did you turn the camera this way at 90 degrees? Like, how did you achieve that? He was like, it's it's, I don't think he thinks of himself as a technical filmmaker, though. His it's so technically impressive. I, I think he thinks of himself as. Like a sociologist. Yeah, it's a means to an end. The film, the, the yeah. filming, the, the technique of it is a means to an end, and the end is uh, to just look. Because mm-hmm. I still, I remember what shot it was in the square. I think it might be the last shot or one of the last shots. There's this spinning shot of um, Class Bang and his two daughters walking upstairs together, mm-hmm. and somebody said, "How? Why did you choose to do the spinning camera like that?" And he was like, uh, yeah. I liked it. Yeah. I liked the way it looked. You know, it wasn't, a, there, maybe there is, and he just doesn't care to talk about it. The the sensation that a certain camera move or, or not move might uh, elicit. 
I don't think that matters to him. I think it matters is is the characters' reactions and the audience's reactions to the characters. Yeah, if you feel, that's why he's making the film. Yeah, if you feel the frame, you're not paying attention to what's in it. Exactly, and I can see him being upset about that. Yeah. My thanks to Ricky Tolman, whose new film Run This Town opens in theaters in the U.S. and Canada this Friday, March 6th, and it'll also be available digitally in the U.S. as well. Thanks also to Elevation Pictures. They know what they did. You can find Ricky on Twitter at Ricky Tolman, all one word, and you can find Force Majeure on Blu-ray and DVD from Magnolia Home Entertainment and streaming on Hoopla in the U.S. and Canada, and also streaming in the U.S. on Hulu, Tubi, Canopy, and Magnolia Selects. It's also available for rent and purchase on iTunes. As always, you can find me on Twitter at Norm Wilner and elsewhere on the internet at NowToronto.com. You can also find this podcast on Twitter at Semcast, S-E-M-Cast, and on the web at SomeoneElsesMovie.com. Our theme song is by The Last Year. If you like it, or the show in general, please say so. Leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts or wherever you've been enjoying us. Every little bit helps. It truly does. And check out the other shows on the Frequency Podcast Network. They're pretty good. Thanks for your support, and thanks for listening. See you next week.